morning, everyone. I'm Josh Amerson. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Dunwoody UMC. So glad that uh, everybody's here this morning. The youth choir, we are so blessed, as always, uh, when they're with us this morning to lead us in worship. And uh, I'm glad that we got to hear their voices today. Um, would you bow your heads with me? Let's join together in a word of prayer. Loving God, we thank you for bringing us here, for giving us life this morning. We ask, God, that you would open us up. God, open our eyes to see your face and open our ears to hear your voice. Lord, would you open up our hearts to feel your presence with us today. Then, God, would you open up our hands so that when we leave this place, we go out into the world as your servants. We pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. A couple weeks ago, I was having coffee with my friend Jerry Carnes. Many of you uh, know Jerry, commuter dude. Um, we were uh, talking about um, a trip that he's actually on right now. This morning, he is waking up from his first night alone on the Appalachian Trail. Uh, he's doing a, I think, an eight to ten day solo uh, journey into the woods. So um, we can pray for Jerry. Uh, this morning. Um, as we were talking about uh, his, his hike, I was reminded of a tip that Bill Bryson shared in his book after his experience hiking the AT, and I, I, I shared it with Jerry that morning. Um, here's what Bill Bryson said. He said, it's always good to have a hiking companion, especially one who's fatter and slower and has heavier boots than you. Because when you come across a bear, you won't have to worry about being able to outrun it. You just have to outrun your companion. So let's hope that Jerry has a slow companion with him uh, out on the trail this next week and a half. Um, St. Augustine, how's that for a transition? St. Augustine defined pride as the determination to be considered equal to God. And that's how this first story uh, about the Tower of Babel is often uh, understood. This was humankind's effort uh, to rise to the heights of the divine and to make a name for themselves that would stand alongside the name of God. If that's where the bar for pride is set, though, being able to outdo or at least keep up with the creator, uh, I'm not sure that, that many of us here would be able to clear it. I just, I just don't know too many people who think that they can outrun the bear, so to speak. But I know a lot of people who think that they can outrun their companions. I know a lot of people who think that because they're faster than their companions, or they're smarter, or richer, or holier, or whatever it is, that that somehow makes them also better. That that makes them of greater worth in God's eyes. And if we understand pride as that belief, as just being better than our neighbor, then this second story that Jesus shares from the Gospel of Luke is something that I think we can all listen to today. And um, as we begin to look at it, I want us to do kind of a group exercise first. I want everybody here this morning to think about something that you are thankful for. Uh, it can be related to your family or your vocation, your health, just the nice weather that we've had this weekend. Whatever it is, whatever it is you're thankful for, what I want you to do is turn to someone next to you and say, I thank God that... And then fill in the blank with what it is you're thankful for this morning. Take about a minute and do that with each other. Okay. Anybody say that they were thankful to God this 33 degree morning they weren't waking up on the Appalachian Trail with Jerry? That's one of the things I'm thankful for. That was a good exercise, right? It is a good thing. It's a blessing to be able to, to share with others uh, what we are thankful to God for. That increases the spirit of thanksgiving in this place. Now, I want us to do one more thing. Um, I want you to turn to that neighbor again. This time, I want you to look him right in the eye, and I want you to say, I thank God that I'm not like you, okay? <laughs> yeah. 
Some of you jumped right into that. Some of you. All right, now, that's a different kind of feeling, right? That does not increase the thankfulness in the room, the spirit of thanksgiving in the room, does it? Um, Chances are, you don't really feel that way about the person you're sitting next to. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be sitting next to them, right? We, we tend to surround ourselves with the people that we would like to be like. Chances are good, however, that maybe there's someone else, maybe on another row, maybe across the room, that you could pray that prayer about. God, I thank you that I'm not like that lady, that I'm not like that guy. Now, don't all of you go look at them right now, all of us, okay? You have to be <laughs> subtle about those sort of things, right? Maybe if it's not in this room, maybe it's someone who goes to another worship service. Maybe it's someone who goes to another church. Maybe it's someone who goes to no church at all. Maybe it's someone uh, who is in your workplace. Maybe it's someone in your school, someone on your basketball team, somebody in your neighborhood. Maybe it's someone who has different preferences than you do. Someone who leads a different lifestyle than you do. Someone who holds different opinions than you do. And you think to yourself, God, I'm so glad I'm not like them. Now Luke tells us that Jesus begins this parable, that he shares it with certain people who had convinced themselves they were righteous and who looked on everyone else with disgust. Now I know this is hard to imagine, but in Jesus' day there were actually some people who believed that that their superior religious beliefs and practices were a reason not to associate with certain other groups of people. That was in Jesus' day. We don't do that anymore, thank God, right? (laughs) And the gospel writers, they remind us of this often, right? They're always mentioning the, the people who Jesus was seeking to be in ministry with, the sick and the poor and the outcast and the lonely, those who show up to the well alone, the sinners, that's who Jesus was gathering with. And the gospel writers are also often quick to point out that there was usually a group of religious folks standing somewhere off to the side, casting a critical eye. And that's because pride puts a distance between us and others. That's That is the one kind of big thing that jumps out to me from this parable, is that there is a physical distance Luke notes there is a physical distance between the Pharisee and the tax collector, just like there is usually a physical distance between the self-righteous folks and the people that Jesus was in ministry with. And even more than that is the distance, I think, that, that was in their spirits. And that's something that's not quite as visible as the physical distance, but I think it's even more devastating. God, I thank you that I'm not like everyone else. God, I thank you that I'm not like them. God, I thank you that I'm not like him or her is not a prayer that rises from a heart in love with Christ's ministry, but rather from a heart that is sick with pride and judgment. Now, Paul, the apostle, he describes the followers of Christ as a body. He says that we are meant to be as connected to each other as our leg is to our hip, as our arm is to our shoulder, But that when pride enters the body, that's when the eye begins to say to the hand, I don't need you. That's when the ear begins to say to the foot, I have no use for you. I don't want you around me. And in our pride, what we do is we start to cut off from the circle that we are a part of, those, those parts of the body that we think are of less value to God or to this community, those parts of the body that we could really do without, those parts of the body that we don't really want to be connected to. And those we look on with disgust because of who they are or what they do or what they've done in their past or the way they live their life, they're no longer welcome at our table. There's a distance between the Pharisee and the tax collector, and that distance is there because pride has entered the body. And that's one part of the story. But there's another distance that Jesus also highlights that 
would have actually come as a surprise to the first people that Jesus was sharing this story with. And that's because we are so accustomed uh, to, to seeing and to understanding the Pharisee as the bad guy in Jesus' stories because we've heard them so often that what we forget is that in Jesus' time when Jesus is first telling this story, the community that Jesus is speaking to, they believed that the Pharisees were the ones who were closest to God. And if, if all we had were the, the Pharisee and the tax collector's resumes, there would be no question who was closer to God because the Pharisee spent all of his time every single day praying and reading the Torah and teaching the law to others. The tax collector didn't even own a Bible. The Pharisee, he gave a tenth of everything that he owned, not just his income, but of like the flowers and the herbs that grew in his garden. He brought a tenth of all of that to the temple and he fasted twice a week. But the tax collector exploited the poor and ripped off his neighbor to pat his own wallet. The Pharisee was the representative of the people of God to God. The tax collector worked for Rome, worked for the enemy, was part of the oppressive system. I don't think that there's really any doubt that if this were in our time, if this were happening today, even if it meant we had to put up with the arrogance of the Pharisee each and every day, the Pharisee is who we would want to join Dunwoody United Methodist Church. The Pharisee is who we would want to chair church council. The Pharisee is the one that we would want to lead the next stewardship campaign because by all outward appearances, the Pharisee is the one who's modeling the religious life that we're all seeking. But the tax collector... I think we would look for every opportunity we could find to make someone like that feel unwelcome here. Hoping that maybe they would move down the street to the Baptist church or to the Presbyterian church. Just maybe let's make them unwelcome so they'll go somewhere else. Because what good is a wretched sinner to God and to this wonderful community of faith, right? And yet, Jesus says that it's the tax collector the sinful tax collector who goes home justified, who goes home with a right relationship with God, not the righteous Pharisee. How can that be? How can that be? The problem with the Pharisee is not that he's righteous. Right? To be righteous is a good thing. To make right decisions to live the way the Bible calls us to live, to do good deeds, that is what we all strive for as disciples of Jesus. The problem with the Pharisee is not his righteousness. It's his self-righteousness. It's his pride. It's the self-elevation above the others who he looks at and sees as those who aren't fulfilling the scriptures. And so the Pharisee doesn't walk away from God unjustified because of his vast knowledge of religion, because of his long list of good deeds. He walks away from God unjustified because he believes he doesn't need God as long as he's so well connected to his own righteousness. And so the Pharisee, you see, the Pharisee gets exactly what he prays for, himself. The Pharisee gets himself. He gets to hold on to and keep his pride but he leaves and goes home without a relationship with God. The tax collector, meanwhile, is aware of his desperate need for God. And he has nothing to boast of. He has no righteousness of his own to lean upon. And yet the tax collector gets exactly what he prays for too. Mercy. So it's a simple story, right? The moral of the story don't be like the proud, self-righteous Pharisee. Be like the tax collector, right? Wrong. <laughs> because as soon as we make this story about not being like the Pharisee, don't we become the Pharisee? Thomas Merton wrote this about humility in reference to this story this morning. Thomas Merton said, Humility is being precisely the person you actually are in the presence of God. Humility is being precisely the person that you actually are in the presence of God. 
And so the point of this story that Jesus tells is not to thankfully imagine all of the wretched sinners that I am not. It's not to thankfully imagine all of the detestable people that I'm just a little bit better than. The point of this story is to humbly recognize the proud and sinful people that we all are, that we all stand before God in need of God's forgiveness. Paul said, if we are to boast of anything, let us boast in the Lord. Let us boast about the Lord. For whether we are the most righteous of all or whether we are the greatest of all sinners, whether we come here to church every Sunday with tithes and offerings or whether we come here with just a long list of our mistakes and offenses from the past week, we all stand equally before God in need of God's mercy. And we all stand before God equally loved. No one's any higher or lower than the other in the eyes of God. That's who we are. This is what connects us. That's what makes us the body, is that each one of us is connected because we're all equal in God's eyes. So let that be our prayer this morning. Let our prayer be to God, have mercy on me, God, for I'm a sinner. And then let us all come to this table because this is a table where all are welcome. Let us all come to this table with thanksgiving, with thankfulness in our hearts for who God is. And let us all together receive God's love and grace. That's what makes us one. Let us pray. Lord, we, we come this morning, each one of us, doing our very best to be the person that you want us to be. And there are things, Lord, in our life in this past week, things that, that we are proud of. Maybe we served the least of these. Maybe we offered a word of encouragement to someone. Maybe we were there in a pastoral way, God. Maybe we gave and sacrificed of ourselves for the goodness of others. God, we also know that there were times throughout this past week where we fell short, where we missed an opportunity, where we thought of ourselves ahead of others. Lord, we bring all of that into this room and we know that you are good and that you receive us just as we are. Give us, Lord, humble hearts to receive your grace and love, to take all of your gifts and offerings to us, to go back out into the world and to be your disciples again always, each and every day, being transformed by your presence, by the presence of the Spirit within us. Lord, help us to see our neighbors not as those to trample upon and to rise above, but as those to come underneath and serve. For, Lord, that is the way that your Son lived his life. And it is in his name that we pray these things. Amen. I want to invite those who are uh, helping to serve communion this morning to go ahead and...